All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Thomas Strolight, one of my favorite writers and thinkers in the Bitcoin space. He discovered Bitcoin in 2013 and became a prominent voice in the Bitcoin community. He's currently the editor-in-chief at Swan Bitcoin, a leading Bitcoin on-ramp. Tomer has shared his unique perspective on the impact of uh, Bitcoin as a transformative discovery on humanity through his writings and interviews. And he's also written and narrated three short Bitcoin films that you can find on YouTube, which are Bitcoin is Generational Wealth, Bitcoin is Beautiful, and The Legendary Treasure of Satoshi Nakamoto. I'm super excited to talk with him today. So uh, welcome, Tomer. Hey, thanks for having me, Bram. Excited to be here. <laughs> it's still yeah, man. can't believe we're all here, but it's great. It's great. And I think, you know, f first off, and I, and I shared a bit with you off mic, but I think I've read almost all of your articles on Medium and watched all the short films. And you are really one of the people that helped me wrap my head around, like, how big this Bitcoin thing is. And you also yeah. helped me discover, like, the spiritual implications that I encountered, you know, mm -hmm. and I see that 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 is the case with a lot of Bitcoiners. And, and so that's something I'd, I'd love to talk about. So, but for first sure. I want to thank you for your work and I'm super Thanks, grateful you. for what I learned. And um, yeah, well, you know. Well, that's, that, those are really kind words and I really appreciate them, especially since they sound completely sincere. Well, I mean, it's true. But I think yeah. also, you know, no, what, I, what I, is I nice, like the truth. you never know how far the stuff you make on the internet travels. Yeah. Right. And you don't know who reaches it. So I think, um, you know, it's very important to share that. And um, yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to start with that. I, um, you, you said in one of the short films that millennials are the first generation to live with Bitcoin. Like they are the pioneers of the new frontier, right? Yeah. Can you share a bit about where we're going and how big yeah. the journey is? Yeah, well, you know, the dest the destination is something that's really interesting because it, what we're it's it's like Bitcoin is like a ray. It's not a line segment. It, it had a beginning, but it has no ending. Mm. And so, wherever you pick a point on the ray of the future of Bitcoin, we should be moving forward. I mean, we're not moving towards a destination. We're just continuously moving forward. And this is different than what humanity has experienced in the past where we've had cycles where we move forward we become corrupt lazy fat debase the money destroy print endless debt and then our civilization collapses and it starts all over again whether it's a shorter cycle or a longer cycle or more global or more local humanity keeps struggling because money keeps breaking and i think what bitcoin represents is a global solution that's chosen at will you know chosen freely by many people in the world, eventually probably the vast majority, if not the entirety of the population of the world. And it doesn't get debased and it doesn't get corrupted and it doesn't collapse because the thing that is corruptible is human beings. And Bitcoin has no human beings to change its rules. You need all the human beings to be in consensus or nobody can do anything. And that's a really, and the rule set to begin with is really positive. It's really fair. It's really just. And yeah. so we have this ability to move forward and to build a world that we can ex rationally expect will still be there generations from now. And so to be the first generation who isn't tempted by, well, the world's going to collapse anyways, so we may as well make the most of it now. But to say we've got a basis for civilization that can go forever is an entirely new thing. And it's, it's so new, even for millennials, that most of them aren't aware that this is the case, right? The vast majority of the population is not aware that something like Bitcoin has been invented and what its ultimate <laughs> achievement will be. Right? And, and it is, it's just this first phase of Bitcoin's existence when the units are being issued still, right? Like there will be in Bitcoin's yeah. long history, a very, very short period just like when they talk about the Big Bang, they say, well, the Big Bang took place. It was a period called inflation. It lasted like one one hundred trillionth of a second. And then everything slowed and everything moved faster than light. And it's like, so we have the Bitcoin inflationary era where there was inflation in Bitcoin. And, this, and it lasted, you know, 140 years by some people's measures, or it lasted just 15 years because 
already the inflation rate is so low, but the distribution of the units and the monetization of the units and the recognition by everybody in the world that this is what we want to use for money for all these great reasons is just in its very first phase. So yeah. it's, it's a, you know, it's a once in human history event and to be amongst the generations who are here for this creation and monetization of Bitcoin is a special, you know, it's, it's a wonder to be alive and to see it. And for many of us, it's an opportunity to play a part in it and watch history being made and contribute to making history. Hey there, I want to ask you for a quick favor. I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah. I think what's difficult, so I think a few things are like, what, what's difficult for people is, you know, I, I love the positive future outlook message, right? Yeah. But then obviously the first nihilistic comment is, well, but tell me how, how does that work? Why is that not a yeah, facade, right? Or a mirage, right? Like that, yeah. that. So it's really hard to kind of like project towards the future. Yeah. And then in the now, also look back at the past, right? As in, you know, yeah. few things. I think fiat money is a blip in the entirety of what is money for, exactly for the well, people, right? Yeah. right? yeah. But but it's our life. So mm -hmm. we cannot look further than that, right? So it's difficult yeah. for people to realize that we are actually lucky enough to live now. Yeah. I mean, it would also be nice to live a couple of generations from now. And, and everything's got two, every coin has two sides to it, right? It's also awful to be, you know, it's wonderful to be alive to witness this history and this hopeful event. It's difficult to have to live through it and witness the decline of an empire, like the changing of two worlds. We were mm. born into one world and we're moving and transitioning into another. This has been part of the great change that's, that's not limited to Bitcoin, the whole industrial revolution, the digital revolution, the information age. Yeah. The rate of change has been accelerating so much that nobody is really matures into the same world that they were born in. Everything changes really, really quickly. But I think what makes Bitcoin this unique thing is it is an unchanging thing, right? Bitcoin isn't something that, oh, last year's Bitcoin is out of date. You need to upgrade to the new Bitcoin. You need to buy the new one. Like Bitcoin is, it's here now. And when people understand this, that it's built for the ages and and in irreplaceable, right? And it's not it's not something that's going to get upgraded and replaced and become obsolete. Like the Bitcoin you have now are going to be the same Bitcoin people are using five thousand years from now, and and we're so early into it. So I think you have to have this attitude that says, "Well, I'm going to be born at some time. May I be born in an interesting time?" And this is this is a very interesting time, and mm -hmm. it is filled with challenges, and it and it is especially hard on younger generations because the monetary promises, the monetary guarantees or expectations that were available to them, or available to people of their age, a generation or two ago, aren't available to them now. And so they can see more that something's broken and that it needs to be fixed. But if they don't understand what it is that can fix it, then they're gonna get caught in this trap of very gloomy outlook, hopelessness, disappointment, you know, nihilism. So yeah. I, th I think this for, for like a generation that can benefit so much from Bitcoin, because not just it can help them buy the things that they now can't buy with the fiat system, but can help them have the hope, the positive outlook, the, the spiritual livelihood, the spiritual wealth that believing in a future can give to them is is where I think, you know, more of the value of Bitcoin actually shines. You want to be able to buy things, of course, but you don't want to be miserable at the same time thinking that every purchase that you make is leading to the destruction of the world or, you know, yeah. making things worse or that you're, you don't deserve it. You do deserve a great life. You deserve abundancy. 
and, and, and you deserve it in exchange for doing good, honest work and helping out your fellow human being on the planet. And we fall, our civilization has slipped up on that. And, and Bitcoin fixes it because it's money that doesn't allow the corruption of money. And, that, yeah. and that's really why, why is the money broken? Because it's corrupt. Because there are people who can print it without working for it, send it to other people who receive it without working for it. And then there's people who work for it, who just witness their, the, their work being stolen, essentially through inflation. That's the really short upshot of it. And I, I don't mean, I'm not trying to pick on like wealth. I don't think welfare is the problem. The, the problem is welfare for corporations, politicians, other non-government organizations who spend irresponsibly to win votes, <laughs> enrich themselves and so on, and have broken the trust that's built into the fiat money system. It's, it's been broken every time it's been tried, right? Human beings yeah. are corruptible. And when, when all the money in the world is sitting in one spot, the ability to print it all, that's going to attract tremendously <laughs> corrupt individuals, clever and corrupt at the end of the day. And the whole system just becomes so convoluted and complicated and everybody's really in cahoots together, not because they've met and had a secret agreement. Like they all understand they're there to skim as much money off the top of this money printing machine as they possibly can. And after 70 years or, you know, three or four generations of doing this, it always falls apart. It always gets to the point where they're stealing. There's so many in the class of people who are stealing from the class of people who are producing that the balance tips and, and we end up with a collapse of the money. And historically, this has always been a really terrible time, much more terrible than what we're about to face because there's been nothing to replace the money. And so the empire collapses, trading routes collapse, industry collapses, and everybody goes to subsistence existence where they have to take care of themselves. And then gradually a civilization builds up. Ideally, you get invaded by a nearby empire and then you can use their coins and their laws and everything else. But you go through this period of destabilization and restabilization. And, and what's different this time around is we have this overlay on the world called Bitcoin that is money that anyone who falls out of the system can use, that is money that anyone who recognizes that there's a flaw in the system can use. And they don't have to use it all at once. It doesn't have to be monetized simultaneously. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be perfect in every single way simultaneously. It's just, it's perfection is that it's there and waiting for anyone and everyone, whenever, wherever they want to use it. So if you have the epiphany at the end of this podcast that says, I should be a Bitcoiner and I want to use Bitcoin, you can. Right. It doesn't matter where in the world you are or, or what or whenever you're listening to this, you can. And so can everyone else. But not everybody has to. Right. It's, it isn't like socialism that says every single person has to subscribe to this or the system doesn't work. The system works, you know, it works better with more people because it's a network, but it works without everybody being on it, just like the Internet did. Right. The Internet yeah. got better and better and better as more and more and more people used it rather than worse and worse and worse. Right? And that, that's important for people to recognize. So Bitcoin just gets better and better and better as more and more people use it. They're motivated to invent better solutions that use it, but it's monetization properties as money that can't be stolen, skimmed, printed, you know, corrupted, saves the civilization from all the problems that our civilization is now struggling with. Right? It, it yeah. takes this idea of inflation and puts an end to it. It means you can spend your money whenever you want to without being artificially incentivized to spend it irrationally sooner. And so you can save for a house. You can save for whatever it is that you want to save for. And you know that the consequence of spending it now on something frivolous means you have to re-earn it in order to get to it. Not because it, it wasn't going to go away. And you, you, people spend money because they know it's going to lose purchasing power. But if it isn't, they'll think harder about it, and they'll, and then they'll build things for many generations. And I, I think the the millennials who really start to understand what Bitcoin represents to them and build themselves a life will be thinking not just the duration of their lives, but projecting many lifetimes forward, which will be a privilege that really only emperors have known in the past. Yeah, so many things go through my mind, but I think that's also why why Bitcoin is so fascinating. Like, just in this answer, in like, there's like ten different 
parts that that sure. pop up. But I think the last thing you said, right? Uh, before we move on to this, the spiritual part, which I yeah. definitely want to talk about, you know, yeah. is you know the the rulers versus rule rules based system, right? I think yeah. that's kind of how I always unpack it, right? Okay, there's mm-hmm. rulers, there's other people that influence whatever you use to exchange value with other people, which is yeah. a baseline communication layer, right? Yeah. Versus rules that you can choose to follow or not, right? Yeah. But when you say, okay, I'm going to follow these these rules and I'm going to follow the rules because everyone else also follows the rules. You know, yes. I, I find that very funny. <laughs> yes. Then you get to this corruptibility point, right? Because then you'll be like, okay, but what if the rules change? Mm-hmm. And then you come to understand that the rules won't change because then the entire incentive structure falls apart, right? But yes. then you get to the point where you figure out Okay, but why are there other people in this other system who are corrupting the system? Like, I would never do that if I was in their position. But I think the honest answer is yes, you would, right? <laughs> you, yeah, you don't know. At least the very honest answer is you don't know because you haven't you, been You don't know, but, well, you probably would, right? Like, I mean, if, if you look Sooner at it, if you There'll have children... There's a pressing need. You've got a sick uh, relative. You need some money. Exactly, Yes. Well, if you have children, you see the the entire survivor yes. uh, thing in there, yeah. right? So, yeah. But I think that's that's one of the biggest, like first, one of the first big realizations that you will probably have when you get into Bitcoin. Like, okay, I am also corruptible. If I'm corruptible, and I'm obviously way better than other people, then all the <laughs> other people are also corruptible, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that's a big, a big realization, right? Yeah. Because if you then go to okay if there's money that can not be changed yeah then it solves my well, own corruptibility yes here's the yeah. what i think is the most important easy takeaway from that thing in a world where you don't have an incorruptible option and you realize the people at the top are going to cor- be corrupt and take advantage of the, all the other people there's only two classes of people and you have to choose which one you're going to be in. Are you going to be in the victimizer or are you going mm. to be the victimized? But there's no one who's not a victim. Yes. And, and that's, and that's a real moral dilemma that a lot of people say, you know, for, a, for a lot of people, they say, well, if that's the way of the world, then I'm going to survive in this world. I'm going to make victims of others rather than be their victim. I'm not going to be the, yeah. the sacrificial lamb. I'm not going to be the martyr. Let them be the martyrs and serve me in this lifetime. And then Bitcoin comes around and it's incorruptible and it's incorruptible because it takes rulers out of the system. It doesn't it doesn't ask any corruptible person to behave in an incorruptible way when we know they're not going to behave in an incorruptible way. And so this is the exit. It gives you a third option in life, not to be the victim, not to be the victimizer because you want to be a good person, but you don't want to be the victim. So to be the peer to be equal to everybody yes. without there being an ability for anybody to take advantage of you by changing the rules. And I think that's, you know, the everyone who joins Bitcoin is immediately elevated to the one and only rank of peer. It's exactly. a peer to peer system and everyone's yes. a peer in it and nobody is lesser and nobody is greater. It's like everybody really truly is created equal. Not some are more equal than others as, as uh, who wrote that in animal farm. It was uh, Orwell. Orwell, yeah. Orwell wrote that. And this is, this is the most powerful and liberating thing. I think this will lead to the spiritual discussion that you want to have. It's completely liberating to be able to be a good guy who's not a victim and not have to be a bad guy who makes victims of other, of other people, right? You can play the good guy role in this society and not get fucked. And yeah. that's the, and that's really f- the first time that you can actually look at an object and say, this object gives me this ability. It makes it possible for me to choose to be good and to not feel like an idiot about it, right? It makes the wise choice being good. And so it changes the rules of the game of our civilization completely. And, uh, you know, and I think this is why people have this, you know, this is contributes to why people have this spiritual epiphany to say, I've got something that I can hold on to that appeals to my good nature that uh, that will allow me to succeed for myself in life and not ask me to be the victim of someone else who's succeeding through victimizing other people. Yeah. I'm shedding the victimhood 
And I'm not making a victim of anyone else either. And that's like a fundamental choice to be good. It's I think I don't know if you've read Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, but there's an oath that certain characters repeat in it. And they say something to the effect of, I swear by my life and my love of it, that I will never serve another man nor ask another man to give his life for the, for the sake of mine. And, and that's what Bitcoin allows us to do. It allows us to live our lives for our own sakes with, and not force others to live their lives for the sake of ours, to let everybody live their lives for their sakes. And that's really powerful. Yeah. Like, that's I, I love that. That's, that we have. yeah. I, 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 I don't know if I have Atlas shrugged. I have the other one. The uh, Fountainhead. Yeah. But I want These to, are both I very read. big and important books to read at some point in your life. Yeah. Well, what you said, so, so, I, I didn't know that quote, but how it was in my head is kind of like, you're finally enabled to also trust yourself, Yeah. right? You don't have to trust that others yes. will help you or not, or, or mess with you or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like you get the opportunity to trust yourself and mm -hmm. therefore you also can create the space to figure out what am I here to do? Like, yes. what do I want to contribute? Right. There's yes. no external forces that, that force you to, to choose right. one or the other thing you know, or live somewhere or whatever, like all, all these things. But, but getting there is a big decision, right? Yeah. It's kind of like the, the easy choice is hard life, hard choice is easy life thing, right? This is a hard <laughs> choice you need to make because once you make that choice, the, the other side of it is also the realization that no one is coming to save you. Like you have a vehicle to help yourself, but still, yeah. you, you know, like yeah. the, you, you do have that part. I think I think that this is a really interesting point that you bring up because it becomes an easier choice as time goes by. I think it's still a hard choice, right? Yes. It's still like to say so much of the world around me is is bullshit, right? So much of it is fake. So much of it is deception. Well, I, I think a lot of the younger generation and, and certainly everyone who's awake is saying, yeah, it's terrible. It's true. I didn't think this growing up. I didn't think this when I was younger, but I, I think it now. And I, and I think I'm right now. I, I think I was wrong earlier. So there's this gradual awakening that there's this broken game where you're, you know, you victimize, maybe you also feel victimized. So you justify victimizing others and then they feel victimized and they feel justified. There isn't an honest playing field that where yeah, the exactly. honest players win. And, and so You, some people give up looking for it. And then these Bitcoiners come rushing at you and they say, no, look, there's an alternative. There's, a, there's another, there's another game. <laughs> yeah, there's a totally different game where nobody can break the rules and the rules are fair to begin with. So if you play that game, the other people who are playing that game with you, they're, all, they're not your competitors. They're not trying to victimize you. You're not trying to victimize them. They're your peers. They're your colleagues, right? We're all working together to make our lives better, to make yeah. human civilization better, to make the planet better. And when you are, and this is why you see such a big overlap between Bitcoin and like the hippie community and, and all these artistic communities, because once the people start to realize, and that's why Bitcoin is this bizarre paradox. It's got all these money people, people who think about nothing but money and all these people who hate money and think about, never think about money and have no monetary skills. And they're being drawn together by this thing because the people who who understand money understand that it's broken and understand that they can only get even if they're the ones getting away with victimizing they can see that their victims are becoming awake and no longer ready to be victimized to the same degree and that there's too many victimizers to get away with it so they're being drawn towards bitcoin as well and and as to are the best of that of the finance people who were always on the lookout for sound money because they re recognized how broken money was. And they're being drawn together with these people who are like, money is corrupt. Can't you see the corruption in money? The latter part of which is true, right? There's a lot of corruption in money. And, and so get away from it and feel the love and feel the joy and feel the hope and, and you know, and let's build farms. But they're ignoring the fact that they're still being victimized, right? Like, or they're minimizing their victimization by producing less so that less will be stolen from them. And, that, and, you know, and they're producing love and love can't be stolen from them, which is valid. 
but it's not the path towards producing prosperity and abundance. And so now that this thing draws together, you will see the fusion of you know, all these things that look like dichotomies or paradoxes to us that people cannot get along because they're in different camps. Well, actually, see, they're on the same camp because they'll be playing the same game. And in that game, everybody's on the same team, team Bitcoin. Yeah. Thinking about what I call this... Uh in another podcast i think it's uh, i think i called it kind of like forced consensus but mm. i didn't yeah. think it through but it's more like you know i follow the rules yeah. because you follow the rules like i like, cannot benefit from this system if i don't follow the rules right yes. so my my incentive once i choose i have to follow it like and i can be like oh i want to mess with this but yeah. you really you can. can't right you can. <laughs> yeah yeah so that's i i i love that because in my opinion, like the finance people are driven by the greed, right? right. That's obviously not a good virtue, mm -hmm. but, but they will, they will get into this game that is right. unfuckwittable, right? So they right. will get and humbled. Greed in this game, greed in this game is how do we make the most out of the fixed amount of capital that exists, right? Mm. It's not, how do I appeal to somebody with a money printer to print more money and give it to me? That's yeah. not a rule of the Bitcoin game. The, the rule of the Bitcoin game is you want wealth. It has to be real wealth and humanity yeah. has to produce it. It's not, exactly. it's not wealth that somebody else produced that you're now getting a cut of. It's like you've got to put your heads together and we've got to figure out how to apply our time and our energy and our knowledge to build the best things that can exist, that last forever, that are beautiful, that give us true wealth. And so, I, you know, this was the role of finance traditionally back when money in the brief periods in history when money was really sound. I shouldn't say brief. Some of those periods lasted a long time. And the buildings from those eras are still standing that were financed by financiers, right? Whereas yeah. the buildings that we're building in this lifetime are already, cr are already crumbling. Yeah. Um, so there's just, anyhow, it looks like you want to ask another question. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But this is uh, this is good because this is the last point that I wanted to touch upon before the spiritual part. Uh, what I sometimes think when I'm in a very old place, right? Like mm -hmm. something that is 2000 years old or something. Right. I like to touch the wall. And yeah. think like there were other people here that also touched yeah. this wall, like people yeah. like like me, and they walked around here, right? Yeah. And I love how you, in some way, with what you just said, like you kind of romanticize also that picture, like we could do that, right? And there's a vehicle that we can adopt that lets yeah. us do that, and you can actually contribute to it because you will have again the space and time to actually yeah. contribute to it, yes. whatever it is you want to create, right? And so yeah. I think. That is a really, yeah, I don't know if romanticize is the great word, but, but you have good, to visualize word, it, right? Because right? It, like you have to Roman romantic period as well. So it's a, there's, there's a double meaning of the word and yeah. it, it's, but it's like, like I want to be there. I want to yeah. be, I want to create this thing that other yes. people walk by in the yes. next two, in, in 2000 years. Think like, whoa, what, what, yes, what were these it's people a, doing? It's a re you know? Like we have the opportunity to really live a positive life, not in a nihilistic universe, not in a cor fundamentally mm. corrupted universe, but actually a universe that's neutral and objective. And if we invent the right tools, then we end up with a game that builds on romantic notions. It builds on fundamentally virtuous principles rather than vicious principles. And that I think is Bitcoin, like Bitcoin is a system of justice. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't, you can't sue somebody because they, you know, put a fence up on your lawn with Bitcoin. It's not, it's not that system of justice, but it's a system of justice within money. Right? Money is only issued to people who work to create it. Money goes voluntarily from one party to another on, based on mutual agreement. I have to give you an yeah. address. You have to sign your address. Money doesn't get printed into existence for no work. Money doesn't get seized through taxation or, or scamminess or all, all these things. Like you have, to, you have to understand the rules of the game so that you don't lose your money or hand it over to somebody. But violence doesn't win, right? Like all these vicious behaviors, theft, fraud, violence, they are not... They're not only against the rules, they're in, you can't violate these rules, right? Like the yeah. rules are as they, hard they don't as exist. <laughs> yeah. It's like the law of gravity. It's like, I don't like the law of gravity. Okay, well, you can't break it. And if you, I don't like the yeah. 21 million dollar, 21 million unit cap on Bitcoin. Well, you can't break it. It's the rule. I don't like that you have to sign it digital too bad. You, you know, that's yeah. 
that's the rule. And it's like, and it's like a law of nature. So it's a just system that we choose to opt into. And it, and it is therefore stepping into a reality, a different reality than the one we grew up in, a just reality as opposed to an unjust reality. So it, like, when people describe Bitcoin as a portal, it like totally is. You're stepping through this portal from yeah. an unjust world into a world filled with justice. And everywhere you use Bitcoin, you have justice. Like it's an incredible achievement. I think that's what I meant with the forced consensus. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. gravity is just gravity. Like, you, like that's yes. what I meant, right? Like that. So if yeah. I step into this world, then these rules yeah. are there. Like I, right? Yeah, there's nothing and I if can do. You don't do like about the fair rules. You don't have to opt into them. Nobody who's dealing with the fair yeah, rules exactly. has to deal with you either. That's why I wrote one piece called "Bitcoin is a Declaration of Peace." And that, that was kind of the idea behind it. It's like, I don't need to go to war with you, right? I want to work with you ideally. But if you don't want to work with me, that's okay. I'll leave you in peace. You, there's nothing you can yeah. take from me. There's nothing I need from you if you're not prepared to deal fairly with, with me. And that's what Bitcoin is. It's a system of dealing fairly with each other. Some, sometimes it also feels like the these rules are way more clear, right? Like, I, uh, I don't know if you watched Peaky Blinders. No, I but, didn't. I you know, that's about that. 1920s England, right? Yeah. Everyone has a gun, right. for example, right? And there are certain unspoken rules to how they do business, right? Mm-hmm. Like if we make a deal and we spit on our hand and we shake our, our hand, uh, we yeah. shake our hands, we know that if one of us tries to double cross the other, the yeah. other is, is entitled to, to, to kill the, the other person, right? right? And it happens in the show. Right. Mm-hmm. They are consciously trying to mess with the other person. But when mm-hmm. they are caught, they are they are like, OK, with their execution, basically. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah, people maybe used a... to kill each other all the time. We like we make such but, a big deal out of murder because we feel that so... that rule is so clear. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I can also, uh, you know, it, let's say like we are in the 20s. Like I can also decide to not shake your hand if I want right. to mess with you anyway. Right. Like I don't. Right. So once I shake your hand, then then I agree to a set that of that rules. Arm. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and I accept um, the outcome of these rules. Right. Yeah, I I love that. You know, in Bitcoin, we can we can we can go anywhere. But yeah. I wanted to talk about something big. You said yeah. uh, in um, in the last uh, short film, you said Bitcoin is spiritual money. So you link yeah. you link Bitcoin to a journey into the non material spiritual realm. Yeah. Can you elaborate on how Bitcoin? is a gateway to like explore yeah. these existential thoughts and questions? Sure. I mean, I really encourage people to watch the film, The Legendary Treasure of Satoshi Nakamoto, or, or read the essay because we have less time, you know, because that whole film is dedicated to explaining this. But I, but I will uh, offer as quick a summary and as fresh a summary as, as, I, as I can. And I think what, you know, Bitcoin is so new and it has this creation story and it's not, it's not a myth like how Batman came to be where Batman doesn't really exist. And so neither does the story of, of how yeah. Batman came to be, even though it's been told in many really interesting ways, right? It's, it's a really interesting story and they'll probably make another Batman movie with another origin story and every, and millions of people will go to see it. Bitcoin has a really interesting origin story too. And it's an origin story that when you hear it, First of all, you doubt its truth, but you can verify all of its truth. And so it's not a, it's not a story of fiction. It's a story of truth. And then the lessons that you can't help but to learn from it cause a spiritual awakening. And so let, let me, let me explain, right? The Bitcoin creation story is that in the middle of the great financial crisis, out of nowhere appears some mysterious unknown character like Batman. Nobody knows who he is. His name is not Batman. It's Satoshi Nakamoto. And he comes out and he brings with him this crazy invention called Bitcoin, which in which he claims to have solved something called the Byzantine generals problem, which is a, one of these problems that exists in, in the field of math and computer science, which, which scientists and, sci- and computer scientists and mathematicians had basically said, we've got a proof that it cannot be solved. This problem has no solution. It's impossible to solve. Computers will never be able to do this thing, which is to achieve a distributed consensus. And that all these computers will not have a central issuer of instructions and, and be completely decentralized, but will come to agreement completely with each other. It's impossible to do, they say. 
And he shows up with this invention called Bitcoin that solves the Byzantine general problem. He keeps his, his identity secret and he, and he, and he doesn't just d describe it theoretically. He writes the code and releases it again, anonymously or pseudonymously, and it starts to take root in the world and it catches on and amazing things start to happen. And as, as soon as amazing things start to happen, he's got a million Bitcoin uh, that he's mined through, through the process of creating Bitcoin and he disappears. That's, uh, there's no fanfare, there's nothing. He just vanishes. He doesn't keep the money. He doesn't reveal who he is. He just vanishes. And people then start to look at Bitcoin and like if Bitcoin doesn't die when he vanishes, he doesn't bring the solution and launches it. Like the thing takes life, it grows on its own. People like you and I are, are attracted to it and it changes our lives. And we don't quite understand why, but when we hear this story, it brings all these things that we described in the first half of the show, justice and peace and long-term livelihood and all these amazing things. And we, and then the critics of it are like, well, you know, surely this can't be true. Why would somebody not keep the money? Right? Like, trust us, we're in charge. And, and so this story ends up shattering a lot of beliefs, right? Like, yeah. if you held the belief that people only do things for selfish reasons, right, in, within their lifetime. Well, this story blows that away. It shows you a, an exception to that case. This guy, Satoshi Nakamoto, didn't do it for himself. He didn't keep the money. He just left it there. He didn't make himself famous. He didn't make himself powerful. He right. made the example. He chose not to be the victimizer, right? As yes. you just yeah. illustrated. Yeah, he, yeah. exactly. He, he let go of the, he made it a true peer to peer system in a, by disappearing. So he became the one person who, who had to disappear in order for Bitcoin to thrive. But the thing, the thing lives and survives on its own. And if you think people can't build something that is built to last, this thing has been attacked by every government, has been attacked by every corporation, has been attacked by insiders, by, and it, it doesn't just survive these attacks. It gets stronger from each of these attacks. So it, it's like something else in this world where the good keeps defeating the evil and getting stronger and stronger. Well, that's a really wonderful story as well. And you also question, you know, like scientists said he, this problem couldn't be solved. And this guy came and solved it and he kept his privacy and he didn't do it for so. You, you carry all these beliefs that science has already figured out so much, if not everything. They're telling us what can and can't be done. We have to follow the science. You realize that's not true. You're, to, you're told that corporations are incredibly powerful and they'll take over everything. Well, they couldn't take this thing over. You're told that governments can stop whatever they want and they are in charge of the rules. And they couldn't change the rules of this thing and they couldn't stop this thing. So one by one by one by one, this story shatters all these beliefs that everybody's walking around with. And by the time you've heard this story enough times, whether you know it explicitly or not, like 10 or 15 or 20 of these fundamental beliefs about the world have been shattered. You no longer believe that scientists have all the answers and that you can't do what they say you can't do. And you no longer believe that governments can stop anything and everything. And you're, you're somewhat glad for it because you realize that there's all sorts of other problems that they're causing in this world and that you, they might be stoppable. And you realize that corporations aren't all powerful. You realize that you don't have to do something only for money, power or fame. And when you have that, all these are all don'ts. You realize this isn't, that that doesn't. And so you have this blank slate. And filling this blank slate, you have this great story that you can do things that scientists said that can't be done, that you can do so, build something that will last forever, that you can do something for, the, for a cause other than your own selfishness in fame, power, money. Yeah. That it's all these really positive cans. And so this dark world that you looked at, that people were selfish and corporations were powerful and governments were nasty and mean and like, it's like, who cares? None of that is true. None of that is absolute. Here is Bitcoin shining forth, telling me that none of that is true. And it lets you opt into the system, right? And this to me is this moment of spiritual awakening that people, that people have. It's like, there's another world I can step into, a world that's filled with justice and honor and integrity and peace and values other than sh short-term greed, but long-term values. And people go into that world and they experience a spiritual awakening. And it happens in so many different ways. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes the lead up is very long and then the transition is long. Sometimes, you know, you have a, a, a very quick lead up and a very long transition that's shaky at times. And sometimes you have someone who's 
reluctant, 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 and then sees the light and, and they just go tumbling down the rabbit hole really yeah. quickly. But it is, it's always, and you get together then with other Bitcoiners and you see, wow, there's something about this person's spirit that's so much more intense, alive and interesting and unique than, than about the spirits of people who you meet you know, in the streets who sit in cubicles and go to work every day without having experienced Bitcoin. And that yeah. to me is why Bitcoin causes these spiritual awakenings. It changes your belief system about what's true about humanity and true about the world, true about justice. I think for me, the biggest part was kind of like the, the self-actualization mm -hmm. that, that I realized I was always working on yeah but i think bitcoin gave me like the, like the like the kick to go into it or something right yeah. like and yeah. and i and and for me i think it was pretty much like a lots of rational thinking right like like i think you you just had a nice summary of like the people that we look up to or that we think create the frame of you know the world the world that you live in they are you know, I think that's also Steve Jobs quote, right? Like everything around you is created by people no smarter than you. Like it's yeah. true and nobody knows what they're doing and everybody is winging yeah. it. Like, <laughs> you know, I sometimes look at the stars and I think like everyone should think like, what the hell is going on here? Right. And I think people do. Right. Yes. And so I think once you realize that, that, that you are not lower and other people are not higher. Right. Mm -hmm. And that there's a tool that you can use again to, align incentives inside yourself so you yeah. can trust yourself yeah then you kind of get there or at least that's mm -hmm. that's how it went for me right and i yeah. think yeah that's 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 what you see with a lot of bitcoiners right although bitcoin doesn't advertise this right it happens yeah i know it's, it's, it's the biggest it's the biggest gift and it's it's such a beautiful thing to behold when somebody gets the awakening right this isn't mm -hmm. like you're joining a cult and we're saying repeat after me repeat after me repeat after me and and brainwashing somebody it's like somebody emerges not as another clone of the cult member it's somebody does some things on their own and they emerge from it themselves you know, and they emerge from a cult from a cult to freedom to themselves, right? They become themselves. Who were they before? They were employee number 2221657 with job <laughs> yeah. description A, B, C, D at corporation alphabet, right? Mm. And, and that's what they were forced into. This corporation needs that person. They need to be exactly this. And then when you go home, all the commercials tell you what you need to buy and what, who you need to be and what you need to do with your time. And it's like enough you you get to break free and say well who am i really who am yeah. i purely who am i truly and that to me is like every time i see it happen <laughs> it's like you you just you tell the person come here and give me a big hug right and you just know you're yeah. hugging a person who has discovered themselves and fallen in love with themselves it's such yeah. a joyous 100% experience. yeah and when you say like, like, listen, you know, listen to this, listen to this. I think in Bitcoin, it's like, think for yourself, think for yourself, yeah. think for Do yourself. Your own right? research. Yeah. Have fun Yesterday. And, and there are people yeah. who say, I don't like Bitcoin because the Bitcoiners are mean. And, and what are the Bitcoiners saying? They're saying, you got to tell the truth, right? You're not fooling me. Be true to yourself. Like, yeah. let's not play, let's not play games. Do you know, don't but walk your talk. It's walk your talk, right? In the Ooh. fiat world, the, the, the talk is what has weight if the person has some sort of yes, position in a hierarchy or something like, oh, this person okay. says that. Well, then it must be true. And I think Bitcoiners okay. are more like, okay, well, uh, for why example, is it true? show me the why, evidence. Exactly. Verify, give me or, the you know, Bitcoin yeah. is going to zero. And then, you know, I like I like when you should say, you know, well, okay, are you short Bitcoin? Then your yeah. value or your opinion is worth nothing, right? I, right. Uh, yesterday I tweeted, if Bitcoin was a cult, it would be the only one in the world where its members would be invited to think for themselves and not trust any other members. And I, I think yes. that's what you just also that's, said. That's absolutely it, right? I, uh, so right. I didn't see your tweet, but I, but we were in a synch <laughs> synchronous think thought pattern on there because that's exactly yeah. the, the So thing, what right? do we achieve when, when we become more spiritual, you think? Well, I think I think you start to experience values that money can't buy, 
Right. And that is I love that article, it, by the way. <laughs> it's one of my favorites too. <laughs> Rich or poor Bitcoiners have what money can't buy. Exactly. It's yeah. these things are priceless, right? Like you can't put a price on having a genuine friendship. You cannot put a price on falling in love with another person and then falling in love with with you too. You can't put a price on knowing the truth and acting in accordance with it. Like if you are confused by the world because you haven't studied it or you act against the truth and hope nobody notices and hope you can somehow get away with trying to jump over a cliff that's too far for you to jump, like you, you don't get away with dishonesty forever, right? And, it, it, and if you think you got away with it, it's still something that eats away at you. Bitcoin is this escape from all, from all of that. And, and when you can live in a world where you can truly be yourself, that's the reward in and of itself because you get to know who you are. And, you know, I finished the article on the treasure of Satoshi that by saying that's the greatest treasure there is in the, in the world, discovering the pure, authentic, true you, a treasure mm -hmm. more precious and rare than any other that will ever exist. There's only one of you. You want to know what's scarce? There's 21 million Bitcoin. There's one Bram, right? There's one of whoever is the listener there. And to have that be less than its full potential, to not flower into its fullness, is a is a is an irreversible crime. It's an irreversible missed opportunity at the very yes. least. So to be the most that you can be by discovering yourself and then choosing to be that, that's, that's this incredible, incredible uh, gift. And, and, and each one of us discovers their own unique spiritual journey. Some of us follow very similar spiritual journeys as other people, uh, but that's not to say, you know, I'm not saying what's the one true spiritual experience. It's like, it's deeply, deeply personal and it mm. comes from within. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I'm thinking like I, at least for me, it makes you very humble. I love what you said. Like it makes you appreciate the life that you were given yeah right like you're using the life that you were given yeah. and then i thought yeah well that makes you humble and then i think like well are toxic bitcoin maximalists humble i don't know <laughs> but you know it's, it's a funny really dichotomy they are they're humble before the truth um yes you know? yes and, and there there's a re, it's been interpreted in lots of different ways but aristotle said of plato i love Plato, but I love the truth even more when he had a disagreement with Plato about some mm. big existential metaphysical uh, assertion of, of Plato's. And that's, and that's Bitcoiners, right? Like we, it, it starts with this notion of verifiability and provability. It also certainly has attracted people who are drawn to those fields where you prove things, particularly fields like mathematics, where, you know, mathematics is this abstract realm where absolute truths exist one plus one equals two in you know, on the real number line or in the integer line and so when you have they like these axioms and so people are drawn to it uh, who have these um, abilities to be absolutely humble before the truth and we're trying to see how far we can push the truth right like now we have a truth in money that we didn't have before there are people who push it too far, right? And they say, well, I'm going to tokenize gold on the blockchain, right? I'm going to talk to, and there's a gap there. There isn't the truth that exists within Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, it's an immalleable system that reports on it, that keeps track of itself. That's all it does, right? It uses yes. Bitcoin to keep track of Bitcoin. It, it has no outside world thing that it keeps track of. And so it the territory is the map, as we say, you know, the ledger is the token. There's there's one fixed reality within Bitcoin. But if, if you tokenize something like, like gold coins, well, there's nothing that actually enforces the number of gold coins that are in your possession and the number of gold coins that the blockchain reports are in your possession. I mean, like this, this is, you can skim some off the top, someone can rob you and nothing's going to automatically change in the database because it doesn't even know that reality that existence exists, that gold exists, it's being used as a proxy. So this is the big fix from an accounting perspective or a historic perspective or a truth telling perspective. And people get so excited about it, you know, that they run past the limits of the thing, which is another, another point, which is what leads to this aura of shit coining around Bitcoin of all these people who are trying to do something that the technology doesn't actually do. 
Some of them are genuinely excited. Others see it as an opportunity to step outside of the rules of Bitcoin and now reinsert fraud, victimization, you know, and victimizing. And so over time, it becomes harder and harder to see people who are genuinely misinformed about what the overstepping is. And more and more, there's people who are exhausting a scam of there's people who don't understand it, but I'm going to tell them that I've discovered the next great thing and take their money from them. But, you know, again, as Bitcoin matures and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger with its rule set, it get and the history gets longer and longer and longer of the shitcoin failures it becomes easier and easier and easier for people to see that those things at the very least are not the same as, the, as this thing. They may not understand fully why, but they, they realize that every time someone steps outside and does a shit yeah. thing, like for a short period of time, they're like, look at how rich I am. And then everything collapses and they're poor or, the, or maybe they got out, but that, but then the news reports that there were tons of victims of this thing. Whereas with yeah. Bitcoin, you don't have victimhood as we've discussed in so many different angles already yeah. just on this call. I love, I love how um, it's also something I tweeted last week, but it also really clicked for me when I just thought, when I realized Bitcoin is just a thing. It's just a thing that looks at itself and it just <laughs> chugs along and doesn't yeah. care, right? Bitcoin doesn't care. Like it's just protocol and it, it goes and it keeps its own time yeah. and it keeps the ledger that it's gotten. And that is really just it right and i i, yeah. I what There's i like especially too, it's just a thing because so many other things you can fuck with right so i, I would say yeah. it's it's yeah. it's it's just a thing that you cannot fuck with and that's okay. all the yes in the good world. addition good that's a good <laughs> so addition. Add that, <laughs> that's when it's like okay it keep them it's a clock that keeps ticking no matter what you throw you people kick it they ch try to change it they attack it with screwdrivers with fire with guns and it just keeps <laughs> ticking yeah. Tick, tick, tick. But the lesson is also in that, right? When to move from the the nihilistic world that, or the or the like the the zero sum game world that that yeah. we live in, to this hard to understand but eventually simpler world or st more straightforward yes. world, right? That's yeah. th those are the people now that look at it and think like, no, it cannot be that simple. The transactions mm -hmm. must be faster, or this must be that, right? Yeah. And then um, uh, and and then I'm competing. In, in this new game, which is also zero sum, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, you are slower than me, you suck, blah, blah. Right. Um, yeah. They, they, it, it, it's so simplistic that it's so hard. That's why it's so hard to understand eventually. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think that it, there's it's so too good to be true in that sense. But if you don't <laughs> yeah. study it, then yeah. you will step yeah. into the, the trap of your false assumption. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. And so, you know, there are lessons to be learned. This is why Bitcoin is a teacher, right? It'll, it'll let you do what you want to do and you, it'll let you learn the lessons yeah, exactly. that are the consequences of doing what you wanted to do. It's not, it's not yeah. saying, trust me, you don't want to do this. It's saying, please do it. do this yeah. within my system. It's yeah. not preventing you from doing anything outside the system, but lessons are learned when people try to do something outside the system, right? Yeah. Because when they do something again, I, I think one of the, one of the amazing things we like we talked about how the fiat money system has become corrupted. The the co cryptocurrency system, you know, that's outside of Bitcoin, that's not decentralized, became corrupted so fast. It didn't take seventy years for everybody to see it. It was like over four years. Sometimes, like yeah. people would do an ICO and rug pull within the ICO, right? It's like oh, as soon as the money came in, it's and it's gone, right? Other times, it took a few years, or you know, people realize, oh, this thing keeps trending down against Bitcoin, even though it keeps changing its story. Whereas Bitcoin keeps holding on to the same story of these its fundamental virtues and keeps winning. There's 100%. such powerful lessons to be had in this. It's slow but and you steady have to wins. see them, right? Because I think yeah. when people see the rock pools, they're like, yeah, of course, that was to be expected. Yeah. But this token that I just came across, no, they would never <laughs> do that, right? Like right. it's literally what, what we see because they are still here, right? I, I yeah. literally just saw a tweet about these ordinal launches. There was like these different tokens. And yeah. there was a guy who was like, I'm down 80% on this, 70% on that, 90% on that. Like what happened? And then I'm thinking like, what happened? You, you. <laughs> I'm sorry to swear again, but there's a Bart Simpson meme that's that he's <laughs> handing out a cake and it says, I'm sorry, I told you the fucking truth, you stupid bitch. Right. And it's like, <laughs> it's this bitter way of saying, I told you so, but like, well, you were warned, right? Like 
Bitcoin. Or yeah, it's not that you were not warned. Yes, yeah, exactly. You, you betrayed people. yourself again. Yeah, <laughs> you told know. you not to do this thing where you'd be down 80 and 90 and 100%. Yeah. So who's really your, who's your friend? These people who, who gave you the hard truth. Exactly. Or these other exactly. people who said, join our community. And when you joined their community, they stole 80 to 90% of your yeah, money. Yeah, exactly. You, you were a victim and they were the victimizer. Like it's such a, it, you know, because we, we've offered this criticism and someone who was listening to the earlier part of this call might be, oh, no, the, there aren't just people who play victim and people who play victimizer in these games. And it's like you want to see vic the victim victimizer world on steroids go into the cryptocurrency, go into the altcoin space. Right. You want to see yeah. justice and virtue. You go into the Bitcoin space. And that's what people are still so confused about, because the world has slapped the label of cryptocurrency on both of these things, but they couldn't be further fr from each other. They couldn't be further apart. One is yeah. virtual. But to me, that shows that, that shows kind of how big this, this battle also is, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the people in the media are doing it for the clicks. Of course, we call it crypto because yeah. Bitcoin is actually a good thing. It's going up, right? But right. we have to mix it in between because then, you know, we talk, well, we talk about all the stupid stuff like getting yeah. rich and blah, blah. Anyway, yeah. I wanted to ask you, when did you realize that Bitcoin intersected with like this, this philosophy part and spiritual part? I mean, you discovered it 2013. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't realize yeah. that at the beginning, yeah. I would assume. It, well, it was, it, it, so I would say it was a gradually increasing overlapping thing. So like for me, initially Bitcoin was, have you heard about this internet thing called Bitcoin. It's money on the internet issued by somebody that nobody knows who they are. And it uses cryptography to operate and distribute itself. So it was like this technical curiosity and very quickly became a financial curiosity. So I'd say like the pie, the pie chart of my brain is Bitcoin is 50% technology, 50% financial. And the more I thought about it and had the discussions with about hard money, it's like, oh, Bitcoin is liberty oriented, right? It's free market oriented and free markets was always for me uh, a, a big part of philosophy because freedom, you know, free markets presume that human beings are free and ca capable of doing what what their free will suggests. So it was starting to creep into the territory of the political philosophy very, very quickly for me. Um, although still the money thing was just mind boggling and, and the technology was mind boggling too. So there was a lot to learn uh, principally on that, but it wasn't really until I started writing, uh, which was in 2021 that I found what I wanted to, after I got out of me, a lot of the technical explanations and the political explanations that then something else started to come out of me articles like why bitcoin is the most important thing happening in the world and that brought in things like justice and why bitcoin is worthy of being loved and because i realized oh my god i've fallen in love with this thing why what what do i love about it i love its transparency its justice its authenticity it's you know it it's it's complete nakedness that you know it shows itself to us and allows us to inspect every aspect of it and to judge it and it and that it invites us willingly and will accept us at any time and so th things started to get more spiritual for me as i started to write after i had gotten out a lot of the things i wanted to share about the technology and i realized oh this is the tr this is the true me coming out right like Yes, I've done my work to show you that I can reason about finance, that I can reason about technology, mm. that I can reason about logic, I can reason about physics. But I, but me is reasoning about love and philosophy and justice and these abstract philosophical concepts. And here it comes. And, you know, this stuff just started to come out of me like crazy. I couldn't stop it. I, nobody was asking me to do it. It was just happening. I was, you know, I was just voluntarily bringing myself down to the computer and typing. And so I think that this this was my own personal journey as well that uh, that starting to talk to others about Bitcoin in a formal way through writing led to the trend, the discovery of what what else was within me that was the true me yeah the spiritual side I you, you also wrote before that um, there's a lot of courage that's required to, yeah. to advocate for for Bitcoin you know people are opposing it you know okay. uh, unfunded and all these things you know they're skept uh, skeptical mm -hmm. what what has been one of your most challenging moments and and how did you overcome it um that's a really good question you know i i think that there was i put 
I overcame the various fears that I had, like, should I publish an article like why Bitcoin is worthy of being loved? Should I write an article <laughs> from the perspective of the voice of Bitcoin? Like, hello, I'm Bitcoin. Uh, should I go into this Twitter spaces and confront some scammer about something who, who may know more about his scam than I do? So I have to be very careful about how I do it so that I don't just get eviscerated or lead people in the wrong direction. And I think for me, a big part of it was having like taking a leap of faith, having faith in myself um, and and letting myself know that Bitcoin will catch me. Right. If I fall, Bitcoin will catch me. And I had this view when I started writing about Bitcoin that if I take care of Bitcoin, Bitcoin will take care of me. I didn't know exactly where it came from, but it but I believed it. And it, that was definitely a leap of faith because Bitcoin doesn't have, doesn't know that I exist in, in one sense. Uh, so why would it take care of me personally? But in the bigger sense of of the picture, the, a system that doesn't have victims and lets people take care of themselves is, in a manner of speaking, a way of taking care of people. It's letting people take care of themselves, which they can't do properly in the current system. So I think that's where, for me, a lot of the courage came. I have to be honest, like uh, watching Michael Saylor when he came on strong, stack and stack and stack again and never blink and put all his life's worth and all his company's worth into this thing gave me courage to put more of my own net worth and effort behind this. So I think the examples, I don't, I don't want to single out only Michael Saylor, but I don't want to leave him out. I think his, his conduct of commitment and conviction uh, and and sharing the education, like look at how many, how many podcasts he's appeared on and all, all, you know, how many hours of thought he's put in and shared with everybody else. That it was um, very exemplary. And it, it helped me say, well, you know, he's just a peer on the Bitcoin network too. And so am I. So if he can share what he feels is right, I can do the same thing. And it turned out, of course, we're not competitors. It's I, not saying that from a competitive point of view. He shared many of my articles after I started writing them. And that was really uplifting too. You know, and I've yeah. of course shared lots of his stuff. And it's not even just, it's not that it comes from a quid pro quo. I wouldn't share something of his that I didn't respect. He wouldn't share something of mine that he didn't respect. It's not, oh, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's like, oh, this is good. It's worthy of me sharing it. And that, that to me, again, is, is once you put yourself out there and others start to see that your work is worthwhile, they will share it, not for not in exchange for a buy, not in exchange for a favor in return, but on because they find it valuable. And so there's a purity and a truth to that, too, that you're not just bartering, you're not just haggling, yeah. you're not just trading. You're putting the best that you have out there in the world. And other people are saying this is good and with no strings, they're not getting paid to do it. There's an authenticity of the appreciation of goodness that comes with something like that, that is also a very spiritually uplifting experience. Like, you know, what you said about my work at the beginning of this podcast was very uplifting to me. And I really appreciate it. And I know that it comes from the fact that I put in good work and that you appreciate that it's good work. There's nothing to be ashamed, boastful, humble about. It just is, as you say. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably no surprise but i 100 percent recognize myself in what you just said right. L literally why i'm <laughs> basically doing this this podcast right yeah. and 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 after putting in it, it's it's it, it starts as a very selfish endeavor mm -hmm. i'm challenging myself um trying to get inspired by people that inspired me already and and talking with them but then also sharing them with others because I know how much it has helped me, you know, and trying to add something in my own way by by being me with my background yeah. and my story and, and all these things, right? Yeah. So I love that you shared it. And and it's really also like the um, what we touched upon in the beginning, the alignment in yourself, giving yourself space and time, the betting on yourself, yeah. right? The, the, the self-doubt is probably always there yeah. because it's scary to put yourself out there. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's logical. Yeah. You, you would experience that. Right. But yeah. I think the reward comes when you least expect it. Right. We didn't know each other before or well, we, we briefly met in Madeira, right. but you didn't know that I almost, you know, read all, all your stuff. And I yeah. think that is, that those are like fun little gifts along the way yeah. and just the doing 
yeah. is already the inspiration, I think, to yeah. other people, right? Just yeah, the fact. that's what you realize. You, you start with this, like, I have to do this for other people because if other people appreciate me, then I can make a living, right? That's kind of like that. That's, and then you realize I'm doing it's this. It's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. It's like I'm doing this and it's helping me be me. myself. Yes. And there are other people who value me for being me. Yes. And so, oh, the, or, the order, the sequencing got changed and the beauty of the world that you live in got changed because you're not, you're no longer being something that other people want because you're living for their sake. Other people are enjoying what you give because you're doing it for your own sake. And that consi that's consistent with what they value. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there's just so much spiritual lift in that, right? They're not watching somebody who they're doubting and thinking this person's trying to just be what he thinks I want him to be. It's like, I'm seeing the joy of a person being themselves and it's inspiring me to be myself. So it's just like, it's contagious, right? All of these things. They it's an spread. invitation. Sorry? It's an invitation. Yes, it, it, it is. It's, it's a silent invitation to say, look, I'm being me and it's not dangerous, right? It doesn't take that much courage. It's just me being me yeah. and it's wonderful. And that's going to encourage somebody else to be them. And so on and so on and so forth. So, you know, yeah. this idea of having to be popular or having to fit in or whatever, that's still, I mean, there's still some of it in the Bitcoin community. I don't want to suggest that there's none of it, but, but nobody can force or impose it upon you. Right? Yeah. So how does this spiritual uh, journey that, that Bitcoin instills, how does that collide with the constructs of the system that we live in. How do you see that? Um, well, it makes you seem crazy. You know, like if you're someone walking around in this world thinking that corporations aren't all powerful and governments aren't malignant and, and incredibly powerful too, and that people aren't themselves selfish because you've had the spiritual awakening and you say these things to people, they're going to think you've lost your mind. Because uh, they're going to point to all the things going on in the news and all the things going around. And they've got plenty of examples to back them up. But, but it's the same thing as just saying because somebody is a criminal does not mean that everybody is a criminal. And somebody who's living their life to less than an ideal doesn't mean we have to live our life to less than the ideal. And it's, a, it's the same phenomenon of what you can choose to do. And, and I can prove to them that it's not in, intrinsic in the universe that all these bad things that they believe are true. Because I've got mm -hmm. the story of Bitcoin to tell them, look, here's an exception to that rule. It's a, it's a proof by falsification, a proof by negation, right? This, mathematicians understand this. You can't easily prove that the square root of two is not a rational number, but you can prove that there's no such, <laughs> there's no rational number that is root two, I mean, that no matter what, you don't have a ratio there. So mathematicians understand that if you prove, if you provide a single example, that's a negation, right? Root two is an irrational number. Therefore, irrational numbers exist, right? Even mm -hmm. though one is rational and two is rational and three is rational, I can give you an infinite number of rational numbers. I just need to give you one irrational number to prove that not all numbers are rational. And what I'm trying to say, prove here is not all things about the world we live in are bad. There's many that are good and there's big things that are good. And so this is the transformation. This is why it's still transitioning from one portal to another. And it's important to understand, like, you don't step through it all. It, the, the metaphor is given of the matrix, take the orange pill versus the, red, the blue pill, right? And if you take the orange pill, you wake up. But that's not actually totally accurate. You wake up very slowly. Parts of you wake up and other parts of you are still in the matrix. And to pull yourself fully out of the matrix. Look, I don't know that I've done that. I don't know that anybody's actually fully pulled themselves out of all the assumptions. I still like the steak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's still steak from the, you know, there's still vacations yeah. <laughs> and there's still checks from the government. And there's still, you know, the mm. ability to do a white, a white collar job without actually having to ever get dirt under your fingernails and and not respecting farmers or f farm workers, like agriculture workers in the process. Like all of those things are still possible and, and so ingrained and embedded in our habits that, that it is hard to wake up from all of them. You know, I don't think we have to wake up from all of them. I don't know that our whole civilization will wake up from it in my lifetime, let alone even yours, perhaps, right? This could, this could be a very slow transition. And, 
and it's a transition that never stops, right? I, th I think what we imagine as discovering our true selves is pro we probably can't even imagine what humanity will achieve when it's got abundant, clean energy, endless energy with abundant artificial intelligence to complement our thinking and our creativity with stability brought on by Bitcoin and sound money. Like it's very, very hard to imagine because even the science fiction writers of the 1970s didn't foresee the world that we live in now 50 years later from a technology point of view they got some things wrong like we're not really we're not moving at warp speed through space but you know they they never foresaw something as advanced as the iphone or the smartphone in general or the internet fully you know they just saw these computers that you could talk to and they saw video conferencing, which we finally got, but not we yeah. didn't get our flying cars. Like we'll get our flying cars, I think. I think we, but we just can't really imagine how much more we're going to get from this thing. It's going to be, it's going to be really profound, and uh, you know, and that's the gift that we're meant to leave to the next generation, right? Not, not wealth in the sense of look, we I I built up a stockpile of capital for you to then spend, but I. We built a sound civilization that with with a firm base, a, a good foundation on which every generation can build higher and higher and higher. And I think that's where the, the blockchain is such a powerful metaphor, right? The blockchain, people see it as linked maybe from right to left or mm -hmm. left to right, but it's it's one block put on top of the next, put on top of the next, put on top of the next. And each one gets, it doesn't get wobbly as you add more to it. It's like the bottom one gets more and more stable with each one, each thing that you put on top of it, each block underneath it gets more stable because it's like you're building the pyramid of proof of work out. And so it's this wonderful metaphor to say, we will keep going forward only, up only in, in block height and number of transactions and cumulative proof of work. And even it turns out like difficulty and energy per block keep going up and up and up. It's a really powerful monument uh, that describes what humanity is capable of and will achieve with the benefit of this instrument. Love that. It's actually funny because I wrote down the question, is this the matrix? And I wanted to say, is this the real matrix? But it's probably mm -hmm. some sort of yeah. fractal in the universe, etc. But like, <laughs> I know. love the science fiction genre. I think the matrix is great. I think there's so many books in sci-fi uh, that relate to Bitcoin and many of them have not been adapted well into television or movie format. Uh, like, but I really encourage people to read Isaac Asimov's foundation, not watch the Apple TV show, which has nothing to do with what the lessons of that are. Hitchhiker's mm -hmm. Guide to the Galaxy is a very fun book. And there's something about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that makes me feel like this guy had his finger on everything that was wrong and was able to treat it with enough humor that we could <laughs> deal with the pain of it all. Um, and there's something very Bitcoiny about the spaceship called the Heart of Gold that uh, that is it features in the first novel and and many of the others but in part one of this book and there's just so many great sci-fi stories because they imagine like sci-fi is generally about imagining a better world based off of some mm -hmm. technological development leap forward some of it and re remarkably a lot of it recently is very dystopian because rather than hope it's like well what you know how can this technology be used to harm us and some of it is neutral that you know, paints a world with a lot of wonders, but also a lot of problems still in the future. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we're headed for utopia. I don't really want to uh, claim that Bitcoin is utopia. I think Bitcoin is a world without certain problems that allow us to encounter different sets of problems, but better problems to have, right? The, the problem of the corruption of the money is not a problem in the Bitcoin world. The problem of what to do with money, you know, should I build this for a hundred generations or for eternity or for just five generations? What If I'm building it for forever, like what does that mean? So the, I yeah. think it causes us to confront new challenges um, and we'll have disagreements and we'll have learning curves. Someone will build something that takes 300 years to build, but is meant to last 500,000 years. And they'll find out that they should have actually built it over 500 <laughs> years to last 50 million years. Like these will be different problems, but you know, mm. it, and, and how we think about problems will, will change because we'll be working on such grander energy scales and longer time frames that we're not used to thinking about. So there's a lot of exciting change ahead. Yeah. So currently, what 
what do you think are the most significant challenges or or misconceptions that Bitcoin faces? And yeah, well, take one maybe, but how would you address it? Yeah, so I didn't hear what you said. The big one is, or, or did you say so something? pick pick one or two? Okay, like yeah. how, how would you address them? Yeah, I I actually think that the biggest one Bitcoiners fight over very little details right now, but the the big one is making preventing miseducation about Bitcoin when Bitcoin makes it big. Like when everyone in the world is using Bitcoin, do enough people understand? to run a node and why they're running a node and how transactions work, because we need peers to keep the system from becoming corrupted. And if, if an overwhelming majority of people are fooled and they choose to run a different version because some corrupt person has figured out if we make this change, then I can be the victimizer and they can be the victims. Bitcoin will suffer. And the reason that's a big problem is because the longer Bitcoin goes without having a big attack of this nature, the more people forget, that the attacks of these nature might actually be tried. The more that they forget that there's bad people out there, people who want to test to see if the game of breaking integrity works. You know, so I, I think Bitcoin right now is getting its fair share of such people so that we're mindful and aware that we need to remain vi vigilant and Bitcoin's unlikely to be changed or altered for wicked reasons in, in the near future. But how do we pass that message on as times get better, as things improve, we have to have this vigilance and how exactly we will solve for that in what many ways, not just one way, but in what different ways. I think that's really interesting. I think some interesting sci-fi novels could be written about that topic. <laughs> some secret society of self-appointed knights who, you know, who want to protect Bitcoin's decentralization and are, you know, are prepared to communicate through and recruit through generations and generations of no, no attacks to be prepared for when Bitcoin is attacked. Or maybe it is, you know, that we go through some long period of time where Bitcoin doesn't get properly attacked and it's incumbent upon a young generation to figure it out when, when it is being attacked. All these sorts of things um, are interesting stories. I do believe Bitcoin will be attacked in every generation, I don't think we'll get to go through too many. They may, there may be really weak attacks, but there's always going to be the egomaniac who wants to take charge of everything and undermine the world and, and rule atop it. So we're always yeah. going to see this parade of people saying, I am the chosen one. I am the true one. I am, you know, I should be put in charge. I have all the answers. And, you know, the Bitcoiner response to that is stay humble, stack sats, rules, no rulers. And as long as we manage to maintain that, uh, we'll, be f we'll be fine. The speed of adoption would be kind of the second thing. And I don't really view this so much as a problem as, you know, the faster it happens without too much chaos, the better, because witnessing injustice on the whole world today is painful. Um, and you want to bring people into, through the portal, into the future, into the, be into the better and just world. I don't know how fast we can do that. I don't know how fast they're willing to do it. I think that there's probably a lot of people who aren't, who, who are alive now, who aren't going to step, step through that portal, right? In the same yeah. way that there were people who would not look through Galileo's telescope and see that the planets were revolving around the sun. But that's okay. We've got all the time in the world, right? It's, it's a shame for those people. And it's a burden on us that not everybody goes that way. But Bitcoin has to be peacefully chosen and there's no other alternative you can't go around saying well we'll just beat up the people who don't use bitcoin like <laughs> you will violate the principles of justice well, that it brings yeah it's about setting the example i think uh, mm -hmm. what you said about the you know the low the low time preference is yeah. i think one of the main things that that we can show to others and like mm -hmm. just uh, relentlessness in in advocating and explaining education, etc., that's we, we have to put in the work, or at least believe that if we put in the work, that yeah, you know that that what we think will happen will also happen. Like right. I am not a big proponent of the it is inevitable, <laughs> you know. Like yeah. I think I think we should keep talking about it, or you know, start yeah. another podcast or whatever. Like yeah. you, it's you should you it's should in keep a sense, doing it's that. It's inevitable with the proper if people do the proper things, but people are aware of what the proper things are. And so that, that's where you say you know, it becomes inevitable, but it, it but yeah. it isn't right. It's another one of these beautiful paradoxes. If you think it's inevitable, it isn't. 
If you don't think it's inevitable, then it is because you're going to do the work to make it ha happen. Yeah, so yeah, the less, yeah, 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 the less yeah, confident yeah. you are, the more confident I am. Uh, and and like, again, it, it just shows this beautiful design in Bitcoin of these balancing things, right? Like the, the more energy you put into it, the more it requires so that you can't corrupt it or the, the more paranoia you put into exactly, it, the less yes. paranoid you need to be. So it has this perfect medium always of find, finding and striking balance on its own, right? Not through someone stepping in and saying, this is the perfect balance of paranoia and not as, as soon as someone steps in and says that, you're like, I don't trust you. So like, when someone tries to take control of your paranoia, your paranoia and Bitcoin kicks in. So I'm looking at the time. I want to ask yeah. you two more questions. Okay. Is there a, do you have a preview of like a next article or short film or like where, where are your thoughts at now? Yeah, I have a couple of really big projects that I am in writer's block on, you know, and I don't know if I'll ever get them done. I don't know if I'll pivot into something new. They're all in what I would call embryonic stages. One is maybe like second trimester, but still a <laughs> long way away from being born. I have a, like a, I have a big science fiction themed epic myth about where we will go with Bitcoin in the next hundred million years. Uh, it's a really big idea and I'm not experienced in writing it. So I have in writing something of this nature. So I'm struggling with that. I have I have something that I think is the germ of another book, which really is a large piece on money, economics, and history. And again, it speaks about the role of capital and what capital is and in, in a civilization and how Bitcoin fills that need in a way that's never been filled before and what that might mean about the future. So for me, a lot of my work straddles very long time frames. I'm trying to, it is my, my passion for history and my passion for science fiction make me want to write about things that span the, the distant past and the, and the faraway future. And I think that's where all of my big ideas are, but there, some of them are art related. Some of them are just uh, essay related and, and they all feel like they're getting bigger. And so I, you know, as I try to write something bigger and bigger, it, it gets for me so far harder and harder. I have this affinity for shortness. Well, I'm excited to see which, which ones you will, uh, right. which ones you will publish, but I love that. I think again, this is like an example of challenging yourself to follow yeah. what you want to explore and then you'll figure it out along the way or not. And then it's fine too. Right. Yeah. Like, I think that's the, that's the entire point. Right. Um, yeah, my, my last question and I ask everyone the same question is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? That the truth exists, you know, and, and it's discoverable. Uh, and you just have to work hard at it. And there may always be a deeper truth. So you can keep digging deeper and deeper, but you can find truth in this world. Love that. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time and this yeah, conversation. And that was, uh, awesome. that was very yeah. enjoyable. Thank you. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Maybe we can do this again somewhere in the future. For sure. Yeah, you let me know. When. Cheers. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.